been quite a journey as we've made it now through 12 lessons of reaching new levels of faith. My name is Curtis Hartshorn. I've certainly enjoyed this journey with you. I hope that you've enjoyed it as well. Our next class, number 13, is Can I Reach Mature Faith? And this one has a story behind it. You know, when I first started doing these ceremonies, I was charging right through. I was teaching people about searching faith and how to have that and how to have solidified faith and how to have mature faith. And then it dawned on me that I was talking to people who don't even think you can have mature faith. So I had to back up and insert this lesson on can I even reach mature faith? So we look at the five levels of faith. There's imitating faith, affiliating faith, searching faith, solidifying faith. And the one that we haven't talked about is mature faith. But can I reach mature faith? A lot of people, when you're talking about mature faith, they have this idea that it's some lofty, idealistic goal, one that could never, ever be attained. And so I want to speak to the doubters out there, those who think that they cannot have mature faith. And I have four points that I want to make for you. The first one I will state is a question. Does mature faith seem unreachable because you're relying on your own strength instead of on God's? You know, when we start looking so much at ourselves, we start thinking, whoa, there's just no way I could ever reach mature faith. But if you'll take the focus off of you and put it on God, you'll be able to say, wow, I could have mature faith. We have a great example in the Bible in Judges chapter 6. And again, I want to encourage you to sit down if you can and read these passages with me and to answer the blanks in your workbook. But in Judges chapter 6, we have an example of a man named Gideon. And we're introduced to Gideon in Judges chapter 6, and it's really interesting how we first meet him. Look at Judges chapter 6 and verse 11. It says, The angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak that was in Ophrah, which belongs to Joash, the Abizarite, as his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress in order to save it from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Now look at the scene here. Gideon is hiding out in the winepress. He's beating his wheat in there and he's looking out for the Midianites because he's afraid they're going to steal his wheat. And here this angel comes in and says, Greetings, valiant warrior. I'm sure he didn't feel like a valiant warrior at that time. And he goes on to explain why he is not uh, a leader and why he shouldn't be a leader. But God wanted him to lead in battle against the Midianites, who, by the way, had teamed up with the Amalekites. If you look ahead at Judges chapter 7 and verse 12, it says, Now the, Amalek, or the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the sons of the east were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts, and their camels were without number, as numerous as the sand on the seashore. So imagine this vast army, and they're completely covering this valley floor, and they look like locusts. There are so many of them. And God is wanting Gideon to lead the army of the Israelites against them. Look at the way that he does this. In chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Then Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and camped beside the spring of Herod. And the camp of Midian was on the north side of them by the hill of Moray in the valley. The Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give Midian into their hands. For Israel would become boastful, saying, my own power has delivered me. Now, therefore, come, proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is afraid and trembling, let him return and depart from Mount Gilead. So 22,000 people returned, but 10,000 remained. Now, first of all, let's back up. All he has is 32,000 men, and he's going up against an army so vast you can't even count them with only 32,000. And God says, we've got a problem. You have way too many people. And so just announce that whoever doesn't really want to fight in this war, just tell them to go on home. Now, I need to make a confession here. I'm actually a Desert Storm veteran. 
I went and defended my country, and I've, I've never been ashamed of that. I, I'm, I'm grateful to have defended my country. But at the time, when we got ready to go into Desert Storm, if you would ask me if I would rather go into war or stay home with my wife and kids, I can tell you what my answer would have been. I'd rather stay home. Not that I think I'm a coward or anything, but the majority of people are going to make that decision. And in this case, that's exactly what happened. Two thirds of the people says, I'm going home. But 10,000 remained. Let's see what happens next. Verse four. Then the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Bring them down to the water and I will test them for you there. Therefore, it shall be that he of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, he shall go with you. But everyone on whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, You shall separate everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, as well as everyone who kneels to drink. Now the number of those who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people kneeled to drink water. The Lord said to Gideon, I will deliver you with the 300 men who lapped and will give the Midianites into your hand. So let all the other people go, each man to his home. When they went down to the waters, you know there's a couple ways you can drink water out of a stream. You can just put your head in the water and just start sucking up the water, or you can just reach down and, and lift it to your hands. And when you do it this way, you kind of keep your eyes up and you, can, you won't get somebody sneak up on you. The majority of people just put their heads down in the water, but only 300 of the 10,000 men put their hands in and, and pulled the water up to their mouths. And God says, that's the ones that I want. So with 300 men, and we'll not read the victory. I think you know that they, they win the victory. This would be a terrible story if they didn't. But they went on to win this victory with 300 men. Why did the Holy Spirit put this in the Bible? Why does he want us to see this? Because we're supposed to learn that it's not up to us. It's not about us. It's about Him and what He can do through us. And so if you're thinking, there's just no way I could reach mature faith, is it because you're only looking at yourself and not at what God can do through you? You know, we, we get so full of ourselves. We're not the ones that matter the most. It's God that matters. You know, in John chapter 15, verse 5, Jesus says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. He abides in me and I in him. He bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus is reminding us, you're not the vine. I'm the vine. You're just the branches. And that's who we are. We're just an extension of who Jesus is. The power to change is not within us. The power is with Christ. All we do is surrender ourselves to him. He's the one that changes us. He's the one that can give us mature faith if we will trust him. But if you still have doubts, let me, let me express maybe a different way that you're doubting. Maybe mature faith seems impossible to you, and you're thinking, wow, I, I just don't think I could ever reach that. But if mature faith is impossible, God's awfully cruel to expect it from us, isn't he? If God says, I want you to have mature faith, but you could never have mature faith, well, that'd be pretty cruel from God's point of view. I want to take you back to Matthew chapter 17, a passage that we looked at in our very first class when I was explaining to you how we can know God wants us to grow in our faith. In Matthew chapter 17, and we'll start reading in verse 14 together. It says, When they came to the crowd, a man came up to Jesus, falling on his knees before him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and very ill, and he often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. But Jesus said, you unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked him, and the demon came out of him, and the boy was cured at once. And then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, because 
of the littleness of your faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. I made the point in the first class that the the phrase the size of was, was added for understanding in the English, but that actually is not in the Greek, the original Greek text. Uh, the size of or as small as, some translations say, actually the word is just ha, so omega sigma. It's just two letters. And it means as. If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain. I took you to chapter 13 before and showed that a mustard seed is growing. It starts off small, but it grows. Jesus is saying, I want your faith to be as a mustard seed. I want you to grow. I want you to mature. Why would he ask us to do that if we can't do that? We've also looked at James chapter 1, verses 2 through 8, where it talks about the process of maturity. And verse 4 says, but, if you, uh, but you must let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. When Epaphras was praying for the church in Colossae, and, and Paul was kind of bragging on it in uh, Colossians chapter 4, verse 12, he said, talking about Epaphras, always struggling on your behalf in his prayer so that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. We turn to the book of Hebrews. Remember that the Hebrew writer was disappointed that they were not maturing in their faith. Hebrews chapter 5, starting in verse 11. Concerning him, we have much to say. It's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk, not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Time and time again in the Bible, we see this, have mature faith, grow up, be mature in your faith. Why does the Word of God keep asking us to do that if it's impossible to do? God doesn't work like that. He never asks us to do something that we can't do. Maybe you're still doubting that you could ever have mature faith. Let me ask you another question. Do you believe having mature faith means that you have reached sinless perfection? Maybe that's the way you're thinking about it. Well, I'll never be perfectly sinless. It's like I, I'll, I'll never have mature faith because eh, I'm only human. We know we'll never be completely without sin. And so we think that that's what mature faith is, but it's really not. Let me throw some names at you. Abraham, Noah, Moses, Samuel, David, Paul. Would you say that those men had mature faith? I'm sure you'd have to agree that all of those were like, wow, yeah, those were some of the most faith-filled men that ever walked the earth. Let me ask you something. Were they sinless? Were they perfect? You know, three of those men were murderers. Think about it. Moses killed the Egyptian. David ordered Uriah the Hittite to his death. Paul used to order Christians to their death. There, three of them are murderers. They're sinners, just like you and me. They had mature faith. We as sinners can have mature faith. Now, part of the, the confusion, I think, here comes from an understanding of the word for mature, because mature, teleos is the Greek word, can also be translated perfect. Right here in Hebrews chapter 5 verse 14, that word that says, but solid food is for the mature, that word can also be perfect. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48, where he says, therefore you are to be perfect, teleos, as your heavenly father is perfect, teleos again. And so we think, oh, well, that means perfect. In chapter 19 and verse 21, when Jesus was talking to the rich young man, he said to him, if that will be perfect, Go sell all that thou hast and give it to the poor. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 says, And ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect, the will of God. 
1 Corinthians 2 verse 6 says, However, when we are among mature people, we do speak a message of wisdom. Now that's the same word that's translated perfect in all those other verses. Here it's translated mature. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 10 says, But when what is perfect comes, then that what is just partial will disappear. Ephesians 4 verse 13, Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And then James 1 verse 17 says, Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. All these verses are using the same word teleos, so that lends some confusion. But as I pointed out by those, those men who had mature faith in the Bible, they weren't sinlessly perfect. When we are mature, it doesn't mean that we are without sin. It means that we have reached a state in our faith that nobody's going to dissuade us from following God and doing what God says. But it doesn't mean that we're perfect, that we're never going to make another, another mistake. It just means we're dedicated wholly to God. Lastly, maybe you are one who believes that you can never have mature faith because you're thinking, well, if I had mature faith, well, then I would become prideful and uh, then that would be really bad. Well, I've got good news for you. The one excludes the other. The process of growing in your faith actually filters all the prideful and the haughty attitudes out of your heart. As you strive to have mature faith, you will move toward humility, not toward pride. Pride leads away from God. Humility leads towards God. Humility leads toward mature faith. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 3, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. In the process of our conversion and the closer we get to being like Christ, we become childlike in our humble approach to life. And so becoming mature in your faith does not make you more prideful. It makes you less prideful. So you don't have to worry about that. Don't worry about, well, if I become mature, then I'll just start getting all prideful. No, that whole process will drive pride clear out of you. You can have mature faith. God wants you to have that mature faith. I hope I've convinced you by now because in our next class, class number 14, I'm going to show you how do I reach mature faith. We've covered the others. We've talked about the other four levels of faith. Now, how do I get to that point that I can have mature faith? I hope that you will be back for us in our next class and enjoy spending some time with you then. Thank you.